All right, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the session. Uh, thank you for voting for the session. Uh, my name is Keith Tenser. I'm a solutions architect at Red Hat, and I'm mostly working with our enterprise customers in Germany. So I'm going to talk today about uh, operational automation, uh, what it means from a solutions perspective um, instead of from a product perspective. And uh, I'm really glad to see at, at this summit there's a lot more sessions that are uh, talking about solutions. I think it shows a lot of, about the maturity uh, where we are. So uh, I do a lot of blogging. Some of you may have come across my blog potentially. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the concepts behind uh, automation that we have that I've worked with our customers on and the technologies behind this. And I'm going to show you actually how this works and do a demo. Hopefully that works. The recipe for the demo, if you guys want to do this at home, hopefully you do it at home before in a production environment, uh, it's on my blog at keithtenzer.com. So I'll show you guys real quick. If anybody wants to do everything I show you today, it's, it's all documented. Uh, so before we get going, a couple key takeaways. Like, so if you leave with any, anything, I would like that to be um, that we come away with an understanding that operational automation really means two things. It means provisioning, so a provisioning platform and what that automation looks like, as well as an application deployment. Um, until we have an application deployment, we don't really have any business value. So just doing IT like Amazon isn't really that exciting. Um, so the second thing is we really need to decouple uh, the provisioning automation from our application deployment. The reason is, is while OpenStack is, is wonderful and, and awesome, uh, there are also other provisioning platforms out there that our customers use. And um, the customers from a business perspective, they don't really care about IT and, and getting systems. They care about their applications. That's their, their business value. So they are willing to invest a lot in those blueprints for how to deploy those applications. And they're going to want the return on investment, meaning they're going to want to be able to deploy those applications, not maybe just on OpenStack, but on Amazon or other platforms that they have. And in the future, who knows what other platforms might be uh, available. For the context of this discussion, uh, this is about OpenStack. So OpenStack Heat and Ansible are the two technologies we'll be using and talking about. Oh. And um, so before we get into that, I would like to talk about a concept of, that's going on with all of my customers right now. And this is the idea of industrialization of IT. So if we look at the auto industry, I think there's a lot uh, we can learn, actually. Uh, they've gone through this process already that we're going through today. So I don't know if you uh, have all seen uh, the episode of The Simpsons or have watched The Simpsons, probably a lot of you have, where Homer gets to build his own car. Uh, it's one of the, one of the most uh, funniest ones, I think, one of my favorites. And essentially, Homer you know, gets appointed to build a, a common car for everybody. And so he goes off and he builds this car, that, this perfect car for Homer Simpson, right? And um, unfortunately, Homer Simpson's the only person that actually would want to drive this car. And it cost also $80,000. So uh, this project obviously failed miserably, and there was zero reusability. So this probably sounds familiar about how we started off in IT and how we build systems, built systems, and how we, some of us are still building systems today. So you know, I've gone to customers all over the place, and I see over and over again areas where you see you know, Postgres, 100 databases, and 50 permutations of those deployments, right? Uh, so we need to get, and I think we've gone, come a long way there, but we're still not everybody's there, and still not all, all the applications are there, to think about t-shirt sizes and standardization. Uh, it comes down to the 80-20 rule. It's not about the best thing for each individual application. It's about what's good enough, right? So we can invest more time in actually innovating and not building stuff. So auto industry started there, as well as IT. Then things evolved uh, in 1914. This concept of an assembly line came. We all know this. Ford built, basically created blueprints for how to build a Model T car with a couple of permutations. 
ran that through an assembly line, and lots of people were you know, screwing things on and changing stuff and doing things. And if you think about how we do IT today, that's a lot of, very similar, right? I mean, we, we, we build systems that it goes, you know, network guy does something, and a storage guy does something, and application guys come in, and there, there's, there's, there's a blueprint for doing things, but the level of automation is still fairly low. We, we don't have, let's click a button and not just deploy, you know, the, the shell of the car here where then we have to do a lot of work to, to get it to where we want, but let's deploy an entire application. Um, that's running out of the box, right? So uh, in this assembly line approach, um, you know, I think it has a certain limitation, right? You, you can optimize things to a certain point, but then it will not scale. And what really um, the auto industry has done and what really we're after with this industrialization concept is moving our bulk of our workforce and our efforts in IT from running the business, keeping the lights on to innovation and innovating. And if you look um, in the picture over on the right, if you can see that's how future cars are being built today. Nanobots, automated. Uh, there's very few people. There's actually one guy sitting up uh, on the left, and he's probably just admiring the wonder of, of this automation. And so all of the people today that are building cars, a vast majority of them are working on the innovation side and not actually producing and building them. And one interesting stat I looked at uh, from the auto industry is uh, in 1914, uh, Ford, which totally smoked everyone as far as how they could build and how fast they could build cars, they were able to do five cars per employee that they had that year. Today, they do 500. That is because of automation. And if you think about it, that's where we're trying to get to with, with, uh, with IT. So um, at this point, I just wanted to kind of conceptualize things a little bit to understand what what organizations are really what they're really driving and why automation is so important so the next piece um, where I see IT right now is we're kind of you know obviously there's applications that still are you know the Homer Simpsons there's, there's assembly line and there's some that are you know in this industrialization phase um, so I think it's a mix and I think if you look at most companies, you, you can't just cut over. You know, it's you, you you build new applications and you do things using new ways, and you try to move the old applications slowly um, to these new processes or migrate them. So we're kind of in in the middle on the way uh, in this journey. So if we talk about the technologies, obviously for doing OpenStack, we want to use OpenStack Heat. We don't want to circumvent Heat. Heat is the brains of OpenStack. Without Heat, we have a bunch of uh, independent API endpoints that are not connected together. There's no value. I, can, I, 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 I get value first when I orchestrate everything, when I can create a stack. So he basically conceptualizes um, a deployment as a stack because it involves, obviously, an application needs more than just a VM. It needs many VMs. It needs storage. It needs networking. It needs all kinds of things and services. And so we can build that very nicely uh, in heat and, and do that, and we've been doing that, and that's sort of where we're at the point of today, you know, you can either, you know, go to Amazon um, or, you know, go the OpenStack route and do Amazon in-house yourself for a lot cheaper and more, more cost-effective and, and, I think, more value. Um, but uh, certainly some people have taken heat and said, okay, well, let's use heat to do everything. You can orchestrate applications. You can do, you can do everything in heat. But again, I really think there's a value in decoupling the application deployment from the provisioning uh, deployment. And so that's really what this is about. Um, what's missing here is language that we can use that, is, uh, that can, can, can uh, go across many provisioning platforms if, if need be. Uh, a simple language that everyone can understand in the company, everyone can contribute. So that means people that aren't necessarily techies can read uh, the blueprints for an application and actually understand what's going on there. Uh, and so um, that, that's where I really see um, Ansible coming into play and really fitting perfectly with Heat together. Both, by the way, also use the same language. So they're both YAML based, which is, makes it easy to read. Um, so if we look um, at Ansible, uh, and Ansible basically is the, the concept of Ansible is automation for everyone, right? It, it started, Ansible started sort of where you know, we started with CF Engine, and we have Puppet and Chef. And um, while those are great automation frameworks, one of the things everybody always had, had um, sort of 
was disgruntled about is that only a select few people really understood these things and were able to use them. And if we think about the industrializational aspect of companies, having the more people that can be involved in creating these blueprints, in understanding them and sharing the ideas, um, the more value we can, we can generate. And that's why Ansible, for me and for a lot of my customers, is so powerful and um, really, really taking over. Uh, so Ansible, I'm not going to go into deep details on Ansible, but just to give you an idea, there's basically two components. Uh, most of you probably are, have seen or are familiar with Ansible Core, um, which is an open source project, of course, uh, and many people are using. And so Ansible Core is basically a runtime for Ansible, a uh, runtime environment. It consists of plugins and modules to integrate you know, with OpenStack, to you know, orchestrate things with networking equipment, whatever you can, you can conceivably want to automate. Uh, there's plugins for that and a community uh, for, for that. Um, and it basically, every, what you automate at the end of the day is called a playbook. So that's your basically instruction set or blueprint for what you want to achieve. Uh, and then sort of what's missing from that picture from core is tower. So what Ansible Tower provides is an API endpoint for Ansible. It provides management, uh, an ability to centralize your blueprints, your playbooks in a location, um, supporting you know, some concepts of role-based access. If we think about building cars or building you know, complex um, applications, there's lots of teams involved and lots of different pieces that teams want to do or want to, be, want to control, want to drive, and it's about bringing those all together. So you really need a centralized platform for doing that. And that's basically what Ansible Tower uh, brings, brings to the table as far as that goes. So there's many ways to integrate Heat and Ansible. Um, I'm going to talk about two. Um, again, I'm talking about the premise of we want to, from an OpenStack perspective, use Heat. We don't want to circumvent Heat. Uh, and I think there's a lot of value in using Heat. Heat is, grows with, with OpenStack. It's, it's engineered with OpenStack uh, and really understands the OpenStack <laughs> landscape better than anything else is going to. So we want to take advantage of that and leverage that. So there's two ways. Basically, there's the approach without Tower, so using Ansible Core, and then there's the approach with Tower. Uh, so the Ansible, um, the Ansible Core approach uh, using Heat, you can, in Heat, inject essentially Ansible uh, playbooks. You can basically put your playbooks in, in Heat templates and derive that from there. So you end up with still a decoupling in that you have um, a, a provisioning uh, instruction set and you have a application deployment instruction set. And so you can pull that out and, and say you want to roll, roll your application on Amazon or something. You can, uh, you can do that if, if you structure things that way. However, it is a little bit tight, too tightly coupled personally for me. Uh, so I, th I think you know, this, this ends up, if you, if you do things in heat here, you're limiting who, who can really take part in the automation. We all know in complex, there's lots of teams in complex applications and deployments, that, and they really the experts that understand the different components should be able to actually, should be best able to say how things are going to be deployed. So I feel that that's a little bit um, too, too uh, tightly coupled. So what I, really, what I really like is the ability to do this with Ansible Tower. And Ansible Tower provides, basically, you have a playbook in Ansible, and you can create an API endpoint for each playbook. So anything you automate picture has an API endpoint. And so now that I have an API endpoint, right, I can decouple these things very nicely. And that's essentially what we want to do in, in cloud. We want everything to be loosely coupled. That's the idea. We don't want to tightly mesh things together. Um, that's what we learned in the past. Um, and how to do things, you know, um, uh, how we shouldn't do things. So Ansible provides that, Ansible Tower provides that really provisioning piece. So that's the main thing that I, the, the biggest thing I think is, is really great about Tower. It also provides a central management, as mentioned, um, and other capabilities around allowing multiple teams and, and, and users to work. So uh, what I'm going to show to you today um, is essentially a demo uh, using this um, second option with, with Ansible Tower. So if we look at basically the workflow I'm going to show, uh, how this works is you start off, uh, you, you start off in heat. So you, do, you deploy your heat stack. The heat stack will then configure the infrastructure that you need to support your application. 
It then triggers Ansible Tower through a provisioning callback. Ansible Tower then will do a, SC, a, um, a software uh, content management update. So if you're using GitHub or, or whatever you're using SVN, uh, it, optionally, obviously, but you probably want to pull the latest version of your, your instruction set or your blueprint, so it'll do that. If we think about OpenStack, we don't know what IPs and host names we're going to have, right? That's the whole point of OpenStack is to be dynamic and flexible. So we need something that discovers, can discover dynamically instances that are starting up so Ansible Tower can actually talk to them. So we have that. And then finally, when, when, it, when the system's discovered, Ansible Tower can execute the playbook, so basically deploy the application. And finally, we don't want to just you know, have the heat stack complete and then Ansible do its thing. We want actually the heat stack to wait for Ansible to complete and then Ansible to tell heat, hey, the job is actually done because heat doesn't know anything about the application. And that's the, the beauty of this is that we can keep our heat templates and our heat stacks really simplified and really reusable. And the same thing on the Ansible side, and that's, that's really the, 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 the power of this, um, this, this concept. So uh, for the demo, I'm going to basically show a WordPress um, example. Um, that's, what I, that's what I have, that's what I prepared. And so we're gonna follow these steps and we're going to go through basically the workflow that I just uh, illustrated to you, to you all. So. Let's see here. This could go terribly wrong. This is, so to give you an idea, I'm gonna exit out of the presentation at this point. Uh, this is all running on my laptop. My laptop has, is, is a data center in this case with 12 gigabytes of, of memory. So rather, rather minimal. And um, you can see here, this is, I'm, I'm running, uh, I'm running uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, so I have KVM, basically a hypervisor built into my OS. It's the nice thing about using Linux in this case instead of, instead of a MacBook or something. But um, I have a VM running called OSP8. So it's basically Red Hat's uh, OpenStack 8, um, which is, um, so that's running. And in there, uh, I have, uh, if we go to look at the OpenStack environment, oops, bring this over here, um, and look at the instances. In there, I have a, a tower.lab.com. So basically, I've, I'm using the admin tenant here, so I haven't done any user tenants, so you wouldn't quite do that, but you get the idea, you have a tenant, and the idea here is, in each tenant, you can have a tower system for deploying applications and, and blueprints and all that stuff for, uh, for each tenant. You can also, if you want to, bring tower outside of the tenant and have it service multiple tenants. In this case, I've brought it inside the tenant, um, and you can see it has a, a, a public and a private IP, uh, so Ansible Tower needs to obviously talk to systems that OpenStack boots using the private, the private IP, the private network, because that's, that's, that's the only thing that's known. Public is for accessing outside of the OpenStack environment, in this case, my laptop. So for me to access the, the application or for me to access you know, Ansible Tower itself, uh, I need a, 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 a public IP. Um, so that's, the, that's the, basically the setup. Um, I also have a, another uh, WordPress 01 instance that I already deployed in case my demo goes terribly wrong and I can then at least show something. Um, so let's, 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 hope it, let's hope it works. So I'm gonna basically start um, a heat, uh, heat stack deployment. So I, I'm gonna basically, my, my heat stack, I'll go through the heat stack briefly. Um, we'll see how much time we have. I can go into more details and show you guys more stuff. We'll see how it goes. but. Uh, so basically, my heat stack's gonna take a name, I'm gonna call this WordPress 03 actually, and it takes a template, so it's called CentOS WordPress-heat. Um, then I have a, a, a name for my instance, so I've parameterized my, my heat configuration, so I'm gonna make that WordPress 03, and then I'm giving it the private IP of the tower system. So I could obviously hard code this in, in the template, but it's better to um, parameterize those things. Uh, so I'm basically gonna, gonna kick this off. And what we should see um, is that the, uh, if we do a heat stack list, we should see that this thing is running. Um, it's create in progress. And so if we go to our orchestration here and our stacks, uh, we should be able to see that it's, yep, create in progress. And if we go over to the resource overview, we'll notice um, over here 
or over there, you see this blinking hourglass, right? This is basically, I've instructed heat to, to whatever it does, it just waits until somebody else tells it that it's done. And remember, what, going back to my workflow, we want at the end where Ansible is done to tell heat we're complete. So the, the stack is running. Um, and so if we go and we look and see what it's done, um, in this case, I'm just deploying one instance because I don't really have enough memory. So it's an all-in-one WordPress. Um, so I've deployed here. It's deployed basically the instance. I can follow uh, the log messages here and see what's going on. It's basically booting up. Um, and you see basically it, it made this curl call to already to, um, to, to heat I'll cover, or to Ansible. So I'll cover that. What it's basically happening, it's booted up the instance. And I'm going to log into Ansible Tower. And we should see an Ansible Tower now that actually something's occurring. So it's, it's doing a, a deployment. So if you look at kind of the jobs here, um, and we can see um, right now, if we look at the time, it did an inventory sync. So remember, we wanted to first uh, have Ansible download latest versions of our, our blueprints that may exist for the application deployment, in this case, WordPress. And then we wanted, uh, to do, uh, we wanted to do an inventory sync as well. So remember, we, Ansible doesn't know what the instance is, what the IP is. It has to gather all that information. So that has to be part of the process. And then finally, it's going to run the playbook. So if we look and see, um, I'll just show in the inventories in, um, in Ansible, there's basically I have an inventory here for cloud. This is just basically a grouping. Um, you can see right here it, it detected, um, it, re, it ran and found WordPress 03. And if I click on that, it's going to have the IP information. It's going to have the tenant information, all kinds of information from OpenStack. By the way, I can parameterize. I can use all of those parameters in my uh, Ansible Tower playbooks. Um, in this case, I'm doing something very simple with WordPress. Um, but let's look, at, let's look at the job real quick and see what's going on. So if I bring up this job, this is actually my jobs running. You can see um, on the on on the right side, it's uh, it's it's basically the the sort of the, the the standard out. What's happening? It's deploying WordPress. It's deploying a MariaDB. So WordPress needs a database. It's got application. This WordPress example uses Nginx, so it needs obviously a web server. Um, you know your standard kind of three tier uh, architecture. Uh, and then you notice here um, on on the left side, extra variables. Um, on the left, left side, hopefully you can see that. So what heat actually did when we told it to wait, um, we created a wait condition and it actually created a restful API endpoint and a token that we can use to tell heat when we're done. And I, I've passed this in to Ansible and Ansible Tower here. Um, so basically Ansible Tower can, when it's done, trigger heat again to say, hey, it's actually done. We've finished our complete software deployment. Um, and so we can follow in Tower, we can follow all of these things. Uh, while this is running, what I'd like to do is show you, switch over to actually the heat stack template and kind of go through that to give you an idea um, what I've done. So I'm just going to open up the heat, um, the uh, template in, in a VI session here. Okay. so. This is standard. I'm not sure all of you have, have worked with heat templates, so I'll try to explain some of the basic stuff. But basically, in, in the beginning, you want to parameterize. You saw I passed in an IP address, and I passed in some parameters. So basically, this is the parameterization aspects of heat. So we define our parameters. Um, I've hard-coded some things. Like, uh, well, I haven't hard-coded, but I've given a default string. So I didn't need to put the network ID and those things. I, I, I basically used a default. And it's going to use the default if you don't pass anything in. Um, and then you get into the resources, right? So the first thing we see here on the resources is the wait condition. That's actually how you set up the wait condition in heat to actually do this. And that's actually what you want to use a wait condition for is if you're integrating with, with um, other things like, like, like Ansible in this case. Um, so we create a wait condition. Uh, we create a web server. So we, we tell Nova we want a web server. We basically get our parameters. And the only thing it does is it, and I've just used curl here. This is a very basic. So you know, I'm, a, 
I'm um, a solution architect um, at Red Hat. I'm not a developer or product guy. So I've just done something very simple here to give an idea. You could do something more sophisticated. But basically using a curl call is how I'm triggering Ansible Tower. And what you can see is I'm, it's basically JSON. So I'm giving it the extra vars, the heat endpoint. And I'm giving it a weight endpoint is the, basically the variable that heat, heat will assign basically the URL to that variable, and, as well as the token. And then basically I just call uh, the, the tower IP, job templates, and the callback URL. Uh, and I pass in, obviously, for the callback, a, a, host, conf a host key that, that identifies me. Um, so that's some other things that's going on here. We need a port. So we need, we need some stuff from Neutron. We need an IP address for a system. Otherwise, nothing's going to work. Um, so we, we also need a floating IP. This is all basic heat stuff that most of you probably already seen. Uh, and then basically there's the outputs. So in the outputs is where we want to communicate from heat to our end user what we, you know, information. So in this case, I'm communicating out, um, you know, the, 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 the endpoints, the tokens, things like that. So this is where sort of heat, heat guys, guys developing heat stacks will, will want to create and, 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 and produce outputs here that, that might be interesting for their users. So um, if we go now, is there, um, if we go now from, from heat and shift over to Ansible, so that's basically all heat is, right? All we're doing in heat, it's very simple, just provisioning uh, infrastructure and calling Ansible. So give you an idea a little bit more of Ansible Tower. So if I move over to, to Tower here, um, basically the concepts of Tower is you have essentially projects. These are basically GitHub URLs where your blueprints are located. So in this case, I have an examples. And if we open that up, um, this is basically where uh, the URL is for, um, it's my, on my GitHub, um, where, my, where my heat template, is, or sorry, my, my playbook is to deploy WordPress. So again, this same playbook can be used not just on OpenStack, on Amazon, on anything, VMware, whatever, you know, Rev, KVM, whatever you guys have, bare metal, uh, anything. So um, that's the concept there. You see here there's the uh, update options underneath the uh, source URL. So I'm telling it, so when a job is triggered for this, uh, for this um, project, it's going to do a clean, which means it's going to basically wipe the, the local contents and it's going to pull, um, pull things fresh. So I could say, no, I never want to do that. I only want, I, 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 you know, I, I, I want to manually, you know, ensure I pull versions of, of the blueprint when I've tested them or something like this. So you have options here um, to do that. Um, the next thing which I, I, I basically showed already was um, the, the inventories. So in order to do something with OpenStack, we need to know about what, what we're working with, what IPs, what host names, all of those things. And I already showed you guys, I created a group. So in Ansible, you, these groups, it's just called cloud. It could be called whatever it wants. But basically, these groups um, are just groupings of hosts. So we can make the groups, however our imagination or whatever makes sense for the organization. It could be by application. It could be by you know, um, d geographical stuff, location. Um, there's all kinds of, there's no sort of right or wrong way. This is where we really just need to understand um, and th think of a concept that works best um, for what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and then there's basically the job template. So we have a, a project where our blueprints are. We have an inventory that defines the, um, the machines that we're working on. And then we have a job template. And the job template basically brings everything together. Um, so I have one called WordPress here. And essentially here, we define um, what we're doing. So once this updates, uh, you, you'll see here, um, it, I give it a name. I give it an inventory, I give it a project. I, from the project, I can select then my blueprints, my playbooks. So here I've got this, the blueprints, WordPress, Nginx, RHEL 7, but I've got lots of other ones I can select. So a job template basically associates to a, something you're, 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 you're going to automate. And that is exactly where um, this provisioning callbacks comes into play. So you can kind of see on the, on the left side, um, there's provisioning callback URL and host config. This is basically where you can enable that. So you can decide, okay, should my, uh, my, my Ansible playbook, should it be exposed externally via, via API? In this case, we've obviously chosen to done that, to do that. You can see here extra variables. You can, you can put stuff in there. You can, you, can, you can define your own. In this case, we're doing them dynamically. We're getting them from, from OpenStack. 
So you've, you've, you've seen that um, where they show up. And then finally, uh, there's, there's the jobs. And basically, if we look at our job now, it's completed. So we can go through here on the right side, and we can see all the steps that it's done. This is basically what you define in your playbook. You expose this. You decide what the steps are, what you want to communicate, what's going on, how, how it's going, going to work. And um, Ansible has a really cool concept of roles. So you can have basically inside of a playbook different roles. Um, if we look inside of this playbook, actually, there's several roles. Like, for example, MariaDB is a role. The idea of roles is to create reusability. So you may have many applications that use MariaDB, right? And you can basically use the same role that someone's already defined in, in, in other playbooks and, and reuse sort of what someone else has built. And this is kind of goes back to the idea of why Ansible is so awesome is that um, it's so simple and easy that it allows so many people to uh, to basically come up with ideas, share ideas, exchange things, put things together in different ways. It's like, you know, uh, building blocks with, with Legos, you know, and, and what, what can we build and how fast can we build it? And that's uh, something you just don't see with the other automation frameworks. Um, you're going to be um, either you love it and you're going to be the few guys at the company that understand it or, you know, you're going to be pulling your hair out and looking for other solutions. So. Basically, if we go through here to the bottom, we get a recap of what we did. So An Ansible basically highlights it's kind of yellow, orange. So basically, that means that color means something changed. So Ansible, the, the playbook actually changed something. The green color means nothing changed. So every, every, some, whatever it tried to do was already there, so it didn't do anything. And then there's a red color, which thankfully we didn't see. That would mean, of course, we have an error. Um, you can also go through here um, each individual tasks. These are all the tasks now that are exposed. You can go in there. You can look and see what exactly happened. What did it do? What, what commands did it run? Everything else. Um, and um, at the end of the day, basically, I've done one click, right? I just, I just um, started a heat stack. I haven't done anything else but, but show you guys stuff. So now if I go back to my, my, my instance over here, um, I can look at the IP. So I've got this IP of uh, 168. So I can basically should be able to hit that with a browser 122.168. And it should load my WordPress application, right? So there's my WordPress application. And so this is the concept or the industrialization, right? Now I've automated everything, right? And I've got different reusable components. Other people can feed into this. And I don't have to sit here and take a, a request and build something or talk to this person or talk to that person or anything else. My business gets a, a solid process that deploys their applications the same way. Many teams can work together in different levels, the provisioning infrastructure level in OpenStack, um, at the blueprint application deployment level in Ansible. And this is really the, the best of both worlds. It allows the most flexibility um, and the most speed, really, to, 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 uh, to do things. Uh, so let me, um, with that, um, that's basically all I had to show for, for this session. So I think we have another uh, seven minutes or so. If there's, if there's questions or, or, or anything, um, I could open it up. Any? Yeah. yeah uh, could you grab, I think there's a microphone, yeah. Otherwise. Is it on? Yep. Yeah. Uh, regarding your uh, placement of the work of the Ansible Tower instance, mm -hmm. how will it work in the multi-tenant and especially in the single tenant but multiple networks? Yeah. Thing? Will it require that every single VM it spawns the heat template having a floating AP? No. So, so, so basically... Or, uh, having, yeah. uh, or having the save this, you, you need this uh, tower instance inside each network the tenant has. Yeah. So this is basically an implementation discussion, right? There's multiple ways to do it. So the way I've done it here where I'm saying, okay, put tower in the tenant, right? Uh, so obviously it has access to every, everybody that gets provision on that tenant network. If you want to make that same tower that's on, say, tenant A 
uh, available to also do stuff on tenant B, then you have to basically cre uh, allow that networking uh, to, to flow through, which you can do in, in, in OpenStack um, with, with e very easily, right? But that's something you, you would have to do and enable. The other concept uh, is you, and this is just using tenant IPs, right? So we're talking about tenant IPs only, we're not talking about public IPs. Uh, if you wanted to, you could move Tower outside of OpenStack um, and use public IPs, but this would of course require that then everybody that is going to interface with Tower is, is using a public IP, which is the main reason why I, I've done it um, the, way, the way I have. And the way my customers are doing this is, is exactly this way, um, and they're either doing it per tenant or in, often they're, they're having sort of a management tenant that's sort of one thing that, or, or for, for a certain subset of the cloud. Shard network. Exactly, shard network. And uh, putting one tower in and then, and then allowing the access um, through ACLs and, and things like that. Uh, and if you're using provider networks, right, then you don't have floating IPs anyway. So then, then it's basically, you can do, you know, it, it's just a networking, uh, networking access discussion. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any, any other questions? Guess so. Yeah, can you, can you um, or, or if you don't want to, then I'll repeat your question, if I can hear it. How do you handle uh, updates of playbooks or the templates? Uh, how is the interaction there? So you call it one application now, it runs, it's fine. Yeah. It's, if you decide to, to, I want to move to the next WordPress release, mm -hmm. I want to upgrade my reading mm -hmm. from 10.1 to 10.2 when it's out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, um, so the question is basically around updates. Um, so to the, to the playbook, especially like say I have different versions. Um, I don't want to stay with whatever version of Maria I have forever. I want to be able to roll out new versions or there could be other components um, that, that need to get updated. So this is really the, the nice aspect of this kind of designer idea is that you've segregated the provisioning from the application deployment, right? So you can have those, those people that are you know, responsible in your operations team for, for the application and testing the versions and all of this stuff, they can make it available. They can basically have the only ones that have access, for example, to check in uh, to, to your blueprints and things like that. Um, you can do different processes. So you could have an automatic process, which I have here. I just download the latest version. So this means from an OpenStack perspective, um, somebody gives me a URL. So they give me a URL to what's the, what's the blueprint for my deployment. I consume that in OpenStack and have a standard process. I don't need to care about what that application does. They're responsible then for, you know, what versions, how, you know, when they upgrade pieces and things like that. Then, um, since it's a heat stack, you know, what do, what do we do with, with OpenStack or the idea with cloud is, you know, not to be, you know, let's tinker around with a running system and constantly editing rows. We throw it away and create a new, a new stack that's built off the, um, the appropriate version. You could certainly do an upgrade process if you wanted to do that for, you know, um, so let's say non-cloudy type applications that, require this sort of constant maintenance process. But um, basically, you, you have all the options open. The nice thing is, here you see the nice thing of the segregation, because if they were coupled, uh, your provisioning logic, your provisioning blueprint with your application blueprint, this would be much more difficult uh, to, to do. Yep. Uh, I think it's, there's only one, yeah. But uh, um, as as you know, Open OpenStack Ansible project doesn't support Red Hat distribution of Linux, and so do you think um, Ansible doesn't fit to deploy OpenStack itself? Okay, so. Um yeah, I mean, this is one of the, when I talked about the different ways you can combine Ansible and, and Heat, so I'm not, I'm not going to sit up here and say that this way that I showed is the only way. This is the way that I've seen a lot of success with the customers that I'm working with um, in the field and, and that they really enjoy. Um, you could certainly say, you know what, I don't want to deal with Heat at all. Um, I just want to have one blueprint language for my infrastructure and for my applications, and I want to use Ansible uh, to do that. And in this case, you could deploy, and Ansible will talk to then um, different services, Nova and whatever else it needs to talk to, and do that. Um, I don't have the details on 
you know, what kind of gaps there may be there. I would suspect, though, that heat is going to be a lot more powerful in the context of OpenStack because it's engineered and designed with OpenStack and Ansible then basically after the fact has a module that talks to OpenStack and they then go, oh, there's a new feature here for this and that and they start, you know, building around um, the automation pieces for that. But again, that, that's a decision, you know, that there's no, I'm not, I wouldn't say that that's, that's a wrong approach or, or a, a worse approach. That's also definitely an approach I've seen and customers are taking. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah? I want to ask if, uh, how the inventory in Ansible Tower was created. Was uh -huh. it created from his template or uh, where is it defined? Yeah, okay. I can show you guys that real well. We have 30, 30 seconds. I see what I can do. Um, I didn't show this, but in Ansible we have essentially um, uh, credentials. Uh, so we basically, I have two credentials here. I have one for CentOS and one for OSP8. So the CentOS is, you know, when we access OpenStack, we need a SSH key. We don't have username and passwords, right? So uh, Ansible provides a store for these kind of credentials to do this. The other thing it provides is, is access to OpenStack itself. So when it's running these inventories, it's not actually looking at, at, at the heat template. It's going to, uh, when I configure and look at the inventory, I'll just bring this up right, right here. And if I edit this um, OSP8 inventory, um, basically I, I decide here um, what my credentials are. When I give it a credential, I give it a URL. So basically I give it a, a, what tenant I'm, I'm going to be talking to. In this case, the admin tenant, so it's gonna get basically everything. But at, at this case, I would put that. And so it's gonna be talking to Nova and getting the information directly um, from Nova. So this is a part of Tower. Tower actually has the ability to do dynamic discoveries and all of these things. So you can do this without Tower, but it involves creating lots of um, inventory scripts and lots of basically, you, you, at the end of the day, you need an inventory of what the hosts are that you have. How you do that and create that is, is up to you. If you're using Tower, though, it, it already has the intelligence to talk to OpenStack and get that information. And so it's going to be able to get IP uh, information, host name information, basically everything when you, do, um, when you do a Nova show on your instance, all of that information is sucked into Ansible Tower. Yep. Okay. And don't think anyone's coming in the room, so is there one last question maybe or? Okay, well, I thank you very much and uh, wish you a wonderful OpenStack Summit. <laughs>